<laughs> Welcome along to the flight deck this morning here at the Territory Wildlife Park. Uh, my name is Anna and this morning I've got Sarah out the back and she's there to give me a hand to introduce you all to a range of birds that are found up here in the top end. So every bird we show you this morning is a local or a native species so you might spot it while you're exploring northern Australia. No exotics here in the morning show today. Now I'm going to show you some birds that have adapted to suit a range of different habitats. We've got incredible diversity in our landscape up here in the top end and that leads to great diversity with our bird life. I'm going to start off with some birds from our woodland habitat this morning. Now the woodland covers most of the top end of Australia. <laughs> In fact about 85% of the top end is, is uh, woodland. It's the most successful habitat. And we're starting off with some parrot species that love to live in the woodland. These little guys are bright and colourful and they're generally very noisy. They are called red-collared lorikeets. Our red-collared lorikeets are found up here in the top end in their hundreds and thousands. <laughs> they love the woodland. They are nectar feeders looking for flowers. But we've got larger parrots up here in the top end too. This guy's got a great big beak. He eats seeds and nuts. It is a sulfur crested cockatoo. Now we also have healthy populations of red-tailed black cockatoos, which is quite unusual. So all of these parrot species up here need a certain amount of food that the woodland provides them, and that's really important. The lorikeets feeding on nectar, the larger sulfur crested cockatoos feeding on seeds and nuts. You just want to stop them from trying to touch the birds. That'd be great. <laughs> There's a little finger. <laughs> they do eat insects and a bit of meat from time to time, these parrots. They're not strictly vegetarian. Now, you can have all the food you like out there in the woodland, but if you don't have one other thing that parrots need, then their numbers will decline and you won't have healthy populations of them. And that other one thing that they need for survival is tree hollows. If they don't have tree hollows, they can't continue to reproduce and their numbers will decline. So conservation of old growth forest is really important to conserve parrots. But parrots and cockatoos are not the only birds that rely on tree hollows. There's a good sized hollow down the back of the arena there. That would suit a breeding pair of sulfur crested cockatoos. But clearly this one is home to somebody else. Now I'm sure a lot of you will recognise this nocturnal raptor. It's found up here in the woodland habitat. These barn owls are found all over the world. They specialise in feeding on rats and mice, and rats and mice are found pretty much all over, well, over the world, so consequently these nocturnal raptors have spread themselves across the globe. Now barn owls need tree hollows every single day, it's not just for breeding like with the parrots, they roost in them during the day. If a barn owl was to get caught out during the daylight hours, perhaps it hadn't found a tree hollow to, to a Get, a, get away from the daylight in, it tends to get mobbed by small birds because they know that while they're sleeping on their perches, one of these birds could try and, uh, could try and eat them. <laughs> Got some runaway characters today. <laughs> so they do need those tree hollows every single day. Now barn owls have a lot of adaptations that make them excellent hunters. We tend to think of owls as having excellent eyesight, but a bird like this with a disc face, it's not its eyesight that it's relying upon so much as its hearing. You can only see a little bit better than you and I at night time, but her hearing is absolutely phenomenal. So an owl like this can hunt with just using its hearing. So even if it never sees that little mouse that it is after, it is able to pinpoint its exact location using her hearing. Now that disc, that facial disc there is what helps to give her that incredible hearing. It collects sound and channels it into her ears. Just like when you pour water into a funnel, it all channels around and goes through the hole at the bottom, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the funnel collects the sound, it uh, collects the water and channels it into the hole. Her facial disc collects sound and channels it into her ears. Now they're just little slits hidden under the feathers there. You can't see her ears, but they're definitely there and they sure are effective. But little mice have pretty good hearing as well and if they hear her coming, they're certainly not going to hang around, are they? So the next feature of barn owls is silent flight. Normally, if a bird flies that close to your head, you will hear a bit of a whooshing sound, a bit of turbulence as it goes over your head. But when a barn owl flies over your head, I can always guarantee you 
here, you will not hear a thing. I'll get her to do another flight low over your heads and see if anyone in the audience has got supersonic hearing. <laughs> About it. Now, everyone be nice and quiet. We all want to be really quiet as she flies. Okay, and we'll try for one more a bit close to your head. She avoided most of you that time. Now, how does she have this soft, uh, sorry, how does she have silent flight? I've got herself locked onto my glove there. She thinks my glove is the, is the little mouse in question. She's not letting go of it for anybody. <laughs> we'll try a different perch. She's got soft, fluffy feathers all over her body. That's a bit wobbly. Let me help you out there. <laughs> and that reduces turbulence. Normally when air gushes up and over a bird, it makes a bit of a whirring noise. That's turbulence. And her soft, fluffy feathers prevent that. So a great adaptation. She can sneak up on her prey. So everyone nice and quiet. There we go. That was pretty close to people. Anybody hear anything? No, good. <laughs> so a great advantage, she can ambush her prey. Um, they do feed on other things as well, such as I've mentioned small birds sleeping on their perches at night, but they do specialise on those rats and mice and they use their phenomenal hearing combined with that silent flight to make them pretty amazing hunters. So if you've got a bit of a, perhaps a rodent problem at home, lots of mice around, this is who you want to have around on your property. And to encourage barn owls onto your property, as I said at the start, you have to have the tree hollows that they need for roosting and breeding in. So if you do have any old trees on your property, if it's safe to do so, it's really important to leave them there uh, because this is who will come and call at home. And then they will take care of your, your rodent problem for you as well. They're such efficient hunters. So you don't see barn owls very often because they're sleeping during the day, of course, but occasionally if you're driving at night up here in the top end, you'll see a bit of a flash on the side of the road in your headlights because they do get attracted to roads where the insects are. And if you see that, you'll now know it's one of these beautiful nocturnal raptors, the barn owl, and you'll know all about her phenomenal hearing and her silent flight. Now we've got two different types of owls up here in the top end. Barn owls, or disc-faced owls, but we've also got hawk-faced owls, and they're quite different. And they do rely heavily on their eyesight for hunting. And you'll see when our next owl comes out to join us, she's got huge, big yellow eyes, and that's what she relies upon for hunting. And she'll be joining us from the right-hand side in a moment. She, too, is very quiet, so look over in that direction, and you'll see when she comes to join us. Now, the owl that I'm going to show you actually relies on the monsoon forest. So quite a different habitat to the woodland. Here she comes. This one is a rufous owl. She's quite unique looking, isn't she? See the huge big yellow eyes and no facial disc? Phenomenal eyesight on the rufous owl. And the monsoon forest is what she calls home. If you walk through the monsoon forest that we've got here on park later today, which I certainly do recommend, there we go. It's quite a shady, cool place. It's an important refuge for many different species. But you notice that her plumage, her feathers are quite dark brown, almost black in colour. And that gives her perfect camouflage in the monsoon forest. So rufous owls actually sit up in a tree during the day to sleep. They don't have to go into a tree hollow. And they've got the camouflage to make them almost invisible when they're sitting up in a big tree. They do need the tree hollows for, for, uh, for breeding them. Now, as the biggest owl up here in the top end, rufous owls can take pretty large items of prey. And she's demonstrating there how she would swoop down and grab food from the forest floor. And on the menu for a rufous owl would be possums, bandicoots, and things like fruit bats. You've probably seen large colonies of fruit bats, and they almost always are in the monsoon forest. Quite nice, close and handy for a hunting, a hunting rufous owl. Now, monsoon forest is quite a vulnerable habitat because it is only found in small patches across northern Australia. So birds like rufous owls are quite vulnerable and there's very few of them left up here in the top end. So if you ever do see one, count yourself very, very lucky. And we need to conserve the monsoon forest to conserve those sorts of birds. But up here in the top end, we've got extensive wetland and coastal systems as well. So we've got mostly woodland, we've got patches of monsoon forest, but a lot of water at certain times of the year. 
So I'm going to show you some birds now that rely upon that water. A lot of them like to catch fish. And the first one we've got here is a coastal raptor known as a Brahmini kite. Now, Brahmini kites are beautiful little raptors. Well, I think he is anyway. I'm a bit biased because I did help to raise this particular individual from an egg. <laughs> but I think you'll all agree with that lovely white head and chest. This is a beautiful looking raptor. Now, Brahmini kites are similar in nature to the black kites and whistling kites that you see everywhere up here in the top end. So I'm sure all of you would have seen the brown birds flying above the highway and the roads up here, anywhere when you drive in the Northern Territory. You almost always see black and whistling kites. And they're scavengers, they're looking for roadkill, or they're also feeding on insects up in the air, like the brownie kite is demonstrating here. One thing the Northern Territory has got a lot of is insects, and that's why kites have been able to be so successful up here in the top end. We've got hundreds of kites everywhere. So they're quite capable of catching insects while they're flying, like the brownie kite is demonstrating here. Did you notice he ate that piece while he was flying? Passed it straight from his feet up to his beak. We call it eating on the whip. It is something quite unique to kites. Other birds, when they catch food, are the raptors. They take it back to a perch to eat. Let's see if he'll show you again. There we go. So kites have practiced this ability because it makes them a lot more competitive. It makes them more efficient. They're not wasting time and energy. But normally when you see kites, there's not just one. There's a whole big group and they're all competing for food. The quicker you can be, the more food you're going to get. And kites will pirate from each other. They'll steal food from each other. So if they carry their food for too long, another kite will fly upside down underneath it and rip the food out of its talons. So if you eat it straight away, that ensures no one's going to steal it from you, doesn't it? So kites are pretty good at eating while they're in flight. But Brahmini kites do love to do a bit of fishing. The mangrove habitats that fringe the northern coastline of Australia are ideal habitat for Brahmini kites because they are natural fish nurseries. So lots of small fish seeking refuge amongst the roots of the mangroves. Um, Brahmini kites know how to flush them out. They wait for them to come up close to the surface of the water and then they swoop down and snatch them like he's demonstrating here. So one more there. There we go. So Brahmini kites don't really get anything more than their feet and their legs wet when they're hunting those small fish in the mangrove habitat. So mangroves are another habitat that's really important for diversity of bird life up here in the top end. Mangroves directly support birds that eat small fish, but indirectly they support fish, uh, birds that eat larger fish as well because those small fish soon develop, they move out into the river systems and floodplains, out into the open waters in the coastal areas, and they support those uh, birds that like to eat big fish. We're coming now. It's the very beautiful and graceful white-bellied oh. sea eagles. Now the first thing you'll notice about this particular white-bellied sea eagle is that she doesn't have a white belly. Her, her head and her chest are quite brown in colour there. And that's because this is a juvenile bird. She's only about three years of age. So when sea eagles are still young and inexperienced, they're still learning the ropes, they are brown in colour, helps to give them a little bit of camouflage. They don't stand out quite as much. In another one to two years, she'll be a fully mature sea eagle and she'll have a white head and chest. Look a bit more like the Brahmini kite in that regard, but obviously a lot bigger. And she'll have a silver grey on the wings. Now the huge big feet and talons of the sea eagle indicate that they can take pretty big prey items, but they do hunt the same way that the Brahmini kite demonstrated, waiting for the large fish to come up close to the surface of the water, swooping down and grabbing them with their feet. They're not specialised though, sea eagles will eat a variety of prey items, whatever they find around the wetlands, so it can be a lot of birds on the menu for these, these uh, raptors as well, such as magpie geese. They usually need quite a lot of food and therefore very large territories, but if you go out to Kakadu or Karaburi Billabong, places around uh, the top end of Australia, you'll actually see quite a few breeding pairs of these uh, large sea eagles. And that indicates that those ecosystems are pretty healthy. They're very rich in bird and fish life to be able to support so many of those top water apex predators like the white bellied sea eagle. So the brownie kite and the sea eagle will feed on most things found around the wetlands and coastal systems. But we've got another coastal raptor up here in the top end. He's a little bit more specialised, and that's who we're going to have a look at next. 
This next bird feeds almost exclusively on fish. Making his way in now over the papers is our osprey. So pretty much just fish for this bird. And being so specialised, he has a really specialised technique. And in a moment, I will see if our uh, Ostro will show you how he catches a fish in the wild. I'm going to throw a fish into the pond for him and then stand out of the way and let him do the rest. It is, it is pretty cool how Osprey catches a fish. Now he has huge big feet and you can even see as he's flying around, they're like a big ball under his body. Most birds you can't see their feet when they're in flight, but with the Osprey you can. They are so powerful. He's not as big as a sea eagle, but proportionally Osprey are actually a lot stronger. A bird like this, Osprey, can catch a fish that weighs as much as he does. He weighs about a kilogram, and a kilogram fish is a decent size. Now I can hear our Osprey screaming. <laughs> that usually indicates there is another raptor in the area. So have a look at him, he might do a bit of a display. He'll fly up and down, up and down, and he'll make sure his feet are hanging quite low so that all the raptors in the area can see how big and powerful they are. Basically, he's trying to intimidate any other raptors in the area to clear up. He wants them to know that this is his territory. We do sometimes get wild kites uh, joining the show and they have stolen our spray's fish from him from time to time. But he's got pretty good reason to be quite protective of this area. So once he comes over again, I will throw his fish in, but sometimes when he's a bit distracted, he likes to clear the air first before he does his hunting, which is understandable. You don't want to do all your hard work and then have some kite come in and steal it from you. So it's just circling around the back there. He'll come over again in a moment. So I was talking about how he can catch a fish that weighs as much as he does. The sea eagle can only catch and carry back to shore a fish that weighs about a third of its own body weight. So proportionally not as strong as a, the smaller osprey. And they are found all over the world, but they're very critically endangered in many parts because they're so specialised. If anything happens to the fish that they rely upon, such as overfishing or pollution, osprey seem to be one of the first birds to be impacted upon. And their numbers do drop quite dramatically. We've got quite a few up here in the top end, so we're, we're quite fortunate. And it indicates we've still got good fish stocks. So he's still circling around out the back there. So very long, broad wings on this bird. He's able to glide a lot of the time. Oh, he's going to come in and land. <laughs> oh dear. Screaming away. There's one right above, is there? Okay, so that's a black kite above us now, and that's what's upsetting us. Now, the two different common kites are black kites and whistling kites. I can tell straight away that's a black kite because it's got a blue shape on its tail. Can you all see that? It's a bit difficult when they're up high like that, but you'll see a V or fork shape to the tail. The whistling kites have a rounded shaped tail, and they're a bit lighter brown in colour, whereas that one strikes a very black silhouette. <laughs> Our spray is just very busy staring at the kite. <laughs> we'll see if I can get his attention. Sometimes throwing a rock in the pond that snaps him out and he thinks it's his fish. Ah, uh, yep, yeah, that did the trick. But I will get him to circle around one more time before I throw his fish in. Oh, <laughs> he was having a closer look. Okay. Try and get out of your way. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Fish and haul it out of the water and can fly straight away afterwards. The 
I clearly demonstrated that. Now, if he did miss his fish, he'd just circle around and dive again. No other raptor could do that. They'd get wet and heavy and waterlogged and unable to fly until they'd had a chance to dry out their wings. But he just gives a good shake. The water beads off his feathers. They're really repellent, a lot like the duck's feathers are. So that is a great adaptation for catching fish in a pretty spectacular way. Now, I mentioned that we've got quite a few osprey up here in the top end. <laughs> but it doesn't mean they're without their threats. And something that does threaten osprey, and in fact all marine life or birds that rely on the waterways of the top end, is fishing line and ghost nets. You'd be surprised how common that sort of litter is. And birds like osprey often become entangled in it. And you can imagine what would happen if that occurred. They would drown. So if you do see that sort of litter out in the environment, please do your best to pick it up. You'll help Osprey, but you'll also help all the other birds that rely on the This is our beautiful black neck stork. Just before I go any further with this bird, if you could ask all the children to stand back from the fence just while the black neck stork is out. Because she does have a very long reach and a very long beak as well. <laughs> So all the toddlers back from the fence line, please. Thank you. So you'll notice as she comes a bit closer how huge that beak is. That is the important weapon on the black neck stalk, or jabaril as most of us know. And have a look at her in flight. Massive wingspan. Long orange legs trailing out behind. A very distinctive looking bird even when up very high. She comes in landing. <laughs> so I talked about the size of the osprey's feet and legs. They are his weapon, but with the jabaril black neck stork, it is definitely that beak. Now they're not specialised, they'll feed on anything around the waterways. That beak can actually break through the shell of a turtle. That's how strong it is. And they will feed on mammals such as water rats, reptiles, crustaceans, fish. They'll even eat other birds like young uh, magpie geese goslings and their eggs if they're nesting in the reeds. They're a top water predator. They even eat crocodiles. Okay, just a little baby hatch of crocodiles. <laughs> well, a crocodile's a crocodile. <laughs> they sit right at the top of the food chain, these birds. Now, even from a distance, I'm sure you can all tell the colour of the eye of this bird. It's yellow, isn't it? It's a real golden yellow colour. The reason I point that out is because it indicates that this is a female. The males have a black to brown coloured eye, and the females have the yellow eye. Otherwise, they look exactly the same. Both genders get the beautiful coloration and the purple crown, which is quite unique in the bird world. It is just the males that look so striking. Anywhere across Northern Australia where there's water, there is a chance of seeing a jabaril black neck stalk. They're a reasonably common sighting. And they are great to see around, not just because of their beauty, but they too indicate the health of the ecosystem that they rely upon. For a body of water to support an apex predator, it indicates that everything below that bird in the food chain is in pretty good work working order. So that is really important as well. Our bird next stalk has headed for home, and our jabber, uh, jabbery, our osprey, is uh, looking like he's going to start eating his fish. He only does that once he's sure all the wild kites are headed away. Yeah, he's starting to eat now, so that's good. <laughs> so in the moment, you can feel free to have a bit of a closer look at him. But that does wrap up the free flight section of the show. But Sarah and I have got more to show you. We're going to be over to your right-hand side under the shade sail in a moment with a couple of birds that we'll have on our glove. Now, it's a really great opportunity for you guys to get close-up photos and ask us any questions that you might have as well. We're always up for a bit of a chat, so please feel free to meet us over there in a minute or so. When you do exit, though, go down the same path that you entered in down to your left to get back out into the park. Now, I hope you enjoyed the show. A bit of a taste of the top end of the bird life. Thank you all very much.